I try to avoid 495 at all times because it reminds me of a very bad thing that happened to my family and I. Living close to the highway, I never really thought about safety factors. It was Sunday night, and we had uh, just returned home from dinner. Jeannie decided to uh, step and watch the Red Sox game. And I turned in early. The weather was very hot. It was extremely oppressive. Shay came home at her curfew. She has a 12 o'clock curfew. She actually came home probably about 15 minutes beforehand. To me, I was like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good on time. I came in and I went straight to the back door just to see if it was unlocked and I just left it unlocked. Thinking that my brother was coming home that night, I wanted to make sure that he wasn't gonna text me two hours later being like, hey Shay, can you come unlock the door, it's locked. Shay was being a good sister and looking out for her big brother. I neglected to tell her that Ryan had called earlier in the evening and said that he was going to spend the night at his friend Ricky's house. I don't think anyone ever prepares for anything like this to happen to them. I heard a muffled sound, like a little whimper, come from the bedroom right next to us. And I thought that was odd. Shay must be having a, a bad dream or something. And Kevin got up at the same time. She said, I'll check on her. And I said, no, I'll check on her, which really isn't the norm. Usually I'm selfish and want to get all the sleep I need. And um, But that, that morning, something told me to get up. I got up and my wife Jeannie followed me in there. I opened up the door and I saw a black silhouette over my daughter. I woke up in the middle of the night to a cold object on my neck. I thought it was a gun. I didn't know it was a knife. I just saw dark eyes in a mask. The man spoke, and it was a voice that I had never recognized before. And he said, if you make any effing noise, I'm going to kill you. And that's when I just kind of went into panic mode. And I just started kicking. And I just pushed my back against the bed, hoping to make as much noise as possible so that my parents could wake up and hear me. And my dad, the first thing I heard him say was, who are you? And the man stood up from leaning over me and just went straight for my dad. And we saw a knife in his hand. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen. I saw a knife, a guy that was probably three times the size of my dad going after my mom and my dad. He was dressed all in black, black pants, black mask, just a terrorizing figure. And he was huge. My dad just jumped on top of him, was trying to grab the knife. I was just trying to get out of bed. I was saying, get the knife, get the knife. The knife was very big, the blade was I'm gonna say that long. And so I tried to grab the grip of the knife, but the man's hand was huge and it, it was ineffective. It wasn't doing anything. So I just grabbed the blade of the knife because I didn't know what to do. I instinctively told my daughter, call 911 and get my gun. Uh, I don't have a gun, but something inside me told me to say that, which would keep him on his guard. What's going on? <laughs> a man came in 
was a cut and put it to my mouth and my husband was there. All right, all right, just relax. Is he still there? I was so confusing with the dispatcher and I was so flustered that I didn't even know what I was saying on the phone. And all of a sudden he got a burst of adrenaline. He erected himself up off the bed with me on his back. That's when I, I knew I was in some deep When the man stood up with Kevin on his back, the knife slid through my hands. I thought, oh, this is it, we're all dead. It was so stop and go where one minute my dad had him under control and then he'd freak out again and it, it, it was scary. When high school I wrestled. I knew a chokehold was the only thing with a guy of this size that I had a chance on restraining him and taking him down was if I took his wind out. And I choked him on the throat and threw my weight back and pulled him with me and we hit the floor. And so at that moment, I turned around and I grabbed the knife again. I grabbed the blade of the knife again. And I ran back into the back room and saw a lot of blood. And I didn't know what it was coming from. And then I looked down and I saw my mom holding on to the knife for dear life and she wouldn't let go of it. I was pissed and all I could think about was I need to distract this guy so that he doesn't try to do anything else. So I'm screaming at him. I'm like, what were you thinking? That's when the man spoke and said, I just wanted money. And I heard the accent, and Kevin and I looked at each other and went, oh, who is this? Who is sitting in front of us? And he said, I'm nobody, let me go. And I said to him, I said, you're not going anywhere, you fat. When I saw the police come into the driveway, I was ecstatic. I was so relieved and so happy because I knew that at that point, everything was going to be fine. And the second that the first officer got into the house, he just grabbed the guy and got him under control and everything. I didn't cry. I just immediately hugged my dad. He was really choked up. It really hadn't hit him yet. He just... I don't think it hit any of us what had happened. As I left the room, Shay was with me. We just held on to each other for a little bit. And I wasn't going to let go of her for the life of me. When I first arrived at the scene, I wasn't sure what to expect at that point. I knew it was very serious. The sergeant told me that a man had broke into the house. He was heavily armed, different types of weapons, weapons that I'd never seen before. Chinese throwing stars, choking wires, along with this horrifying mask. After they left our house with this intruder, Jeannie and Shay went by ambulance to the hospital to tend to Jeannie's wounds. Ryan was in shock when he found out what happened. He felt bad that he wasn't there that he was spending the night at his friend Ricky's house. And it's unfortunate, because he shouldn't, because it's not his fault in the slightest bit. I think he just wishes that he was there to just protect us. Detective Tyros told me that the man that had broken into our house was a long haul trucker. His name was Adam Leroy Lane lived in North Carolina and was running routes up and down from North Carolina up to Nashua, New Hampshire, and various locations throughout the metropolitan Boston area. He had a wife and he had three daughters. That made me sick to my stomach to know. On August 2nd, a few days later, we conducted a search warrant of Adam Leroy Lane's truck. We found his logbook, receipts, some more knives. We also found a movie inside of a DVD player. That movie's titled Hunting Humans. This movie is about a serial killer that goes around randomly killing people without any motive or reason other than to just kill people. Later I learned that Adam Leroy Lane was on the prowl in our town for approximately five hours. He tried to get into at least three other houses before eventually getting into the McDonough residence through an unlocked door. He 
was out in our town hunting humans at night. We started to think, maybe he's done this in other places and just hasn't been caught yet. Diane was my wife and friend, and she's my partner in life. I'd known her since I was 15. Diane was sitting outside on our back patio, just enjoying the weather, talking on the phone. At 10 o'clock, I opened the door and told her I was headed to bed, and she said she'd be up in a little bit. I kind of laughed, because I knew better she just would be out on the phone till late. I just went upstairs, and I shut the door, I went to sleep. I was just laying in bed and my bedroom door opened up and guys started screaming and shining flashlights at me. Guys were screaming at me to get my hands in the air. I thought it might be a home invasion or something. And I started to look past the flashlights and stuff and could see the silhouettes of the men standing there and then I could see guns pointed at me. And then one of the troopers identified himself as a state trooper. So I put my hands in the air. They asked if my son was there and he walked up on the police and put his hands above his head. Then they handcuffed him. I was able to look around. And I see my wife's purse and sitting there with her cell phone and keys on one of the chairs at the kitchen table. And I told my son, we got big problems. Your mom wouldn't leave without her phone and her keys. Then I started seeing flash photography going off. I knew that wasn't a good sign. After about three hours, one of the detectives came in, sat me down, and that's when they told me that Darlene was dead and, and she was killed at the hands of another person. That's when things started to fall apart for me. I remember hearing my son scream. He was in the kitchen still handcuffed. He broke the chair he was sitting in. And he had butt of the refrigerator. There's still two big dents in it. And When I arrived, crime scene investigators were already working in the backyard of what I'd describe as a typical suburban neighborhood. This woman had been on her back patio talking to a male friend on the phone. Darlene's friend hears the call sort of abruptly end, a sort of muffled sound an abrupt end to a call and that, in his experience, wouldn't normally happen, talking to Darlene. He tells his wife they hop in their car and drive to Darlene's home, where he discovered uh, the body on that back patio. She suffered a fatal stab wound in the neck area, ultimately causing her death. I got woke up about 6.45 on the 13th from a phone call from my brother. I answered it, and he's like, Nicole, mom's dead. I'm like, what? You're kidding me. Tell me you're lying. He's like, no, she was murdered last night. And then I just felt my whole life just completely fall apart. As experience has often taught the police and prosecutors, uh, people uh, who are killed at home uh, are most likely to be killed by someone close to them, that this was not a random act, that it was committed by someone who knew her uh, and someone who had the opportunity to kill her, most likely her husband. 
They, they accused me of killing my wife. They just wanted me to break down and say I did it or paid somebody to do it. I knew I didn't do it. Cops took me down to the Pennsylvania State Police barracks where they had my brother and my father. I just remember coming around the corner from the door and just running to me and just grabbing her and holding her and giving her a hug because I just, there was nothing I could do for her, nothing I could do to make it better. So I just held on to her. We both kind of just wanted to rewind time. I never asked myself once if my dad killed my mom because I just knew. My mom had no enemies. She was just a great personality and was just loved by everybody. So it was kind of like, why would someone want to hurt her, let alone kill her? And who would do it? Who could be such a monster? Shortly after the attack, we had to go to court um, and see our attacker. He was kept in a, a plexiglass, bulletproof partition on the other side of the court from us. He just looked like a caged animal. He was disgusting. He wouldn't stop staring at me, and that was the worst feeling in the entire world. I wanted to leap over the railing, actually, because I was so angry at that point. I mean, I really wanted to, to get, a, get a punch in or something. There was no way that we could allow this guy to hit the streets. The judge held Lane without bail, finding that he was a danger to the community as well as to the McDonough family. We didn't know a lot about him at the outset. He had no prior record in the state of Massachusetts, no prior criminal record, but just from what we had at that point, we knew he was one dangerous individual. We put out an all-point bulletin to see if any of the other police departments along the East Coast had had any type of similar incidents in their communities. And one of the first people to respond was a state police trooper out of New Jersey. His name was Jeff Noble. And he had inquired whether or not Adam Lane might have been responsible for a murder that he was investigating down in New Jersey. Morning of uh, Monday, July 30th, 2007, uh, New Jersey troopers uh, responded to the home of Monica Massaro. Ms. Massaro had been stabbed multiple times uh, in the sanctity of her own home. It was just the type of crime that someone with an incredible amount of violence and rage uh, would have done. Monica Massaro was a single 37-year-old female. She lived uh, by herself. She was very active socially. She had a lot of friends, really lived life to the fullest. We didn't have anybody that we would call suspects specifically, and that proved challenging for us. We knew that our victim lived in proximity to a truck stop. We, of course, felt that we should call the Chelmsford, Massachusetts Police Department and just kind of compare notes on the case. Basically, we wanted to know if Adam Leroy Lane was in New Jersey at or near the time Monica Massaro died. So we asked Detective Tyros if he had any evidence, uh, paperwork, logs, receipts, toll records, anything that would indicate to us Adam Leroy Lane's uh, route of travel. And all of a sudden, Detective Tyros kind of stops and he goes, hey, I have a receipt here. Okay, and he goes, it's from Bloomsbury, New Jersey. And we all looked at each other like, did he just say Bloomsbury, New Jersey? When, George? When? And then he gave us the second piece, which was July 29th, 2007, right at the time we believe Monica died. Short time later, I heard Detective Noble say, George, we're coming to Chelmsford.
How can you get 48 hours anytime, anyplace? Want a clue? Your iPad. Reality drama. Exclusive extras. To miss it would be a crime. When we arrived in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, we immediately started, you know, the questions, where's the evidence? You know, we want everything that Adam Lane could have had in his possession at the time of the murder. We wanted to know where was the truck, and we learned that the truck had already been released. We had Adam Leroy Lane's tractor trailer for approximately three weeks. Legally, we were only able to obtain evidence that pertained to our case. At that point in time, we didn't have any other cases. So unfortunately, after several weeks, the owner of the tractor trailer was looking for his truck back. Without any other cases, we had to eventually give him his truck back. Everything in there that belonged to Adam Lane, the owner of the company threw it into a dumpster, which was located um, in the impound yard in Massachusetts where the truck had been. The trash hauling company was scheduled to pick up and empty that dumpster on that very day. We got very lucky. We basically beat the... Uh, trash hauler to the dumpster, and the dumpster was, was packed, it was full. We suited up, uh, it took an entire afternoon, we took every piece of debris and trash out of that dumpster. And in that uh, bottom of the dumpster, we found basically all of Adam Lane's personal property. Clothing, shoes, uh, socks. Without a doubt, every detective there uh, suspected that we were coming across uh, key potential DNA evidence in this case. We couldn't wait to get back to New Jersey submit this stuff to the forensic laboratory and let the evidence basically show us, you know, what happened. Before Jeff went back, he wanted to interview Adam Leroy Lane. At that point, we told him, don't get your hopes up, but it's worth a shot. Going into the interview with Adam Lane, we had basically very low expectations. Because he didn't speak to the other detectives in Massachusetts, we felt he wasn't going to speak to us. Hello, sir. My name is Jeffrey, Jeffrey Noble. Oh, nice to meet you. After Detective Noble went in to interview Adam Lane, my sergeant and I waited for him. We were thinking we are going to be eating dinner shortly. It's probably not going to go very long. After about a half hour, 45 minutes, we realized he's talking. After an hour, we decided, you know what? We better go eat without him. And as we started talking to him, um, it became evident that Adam Lane actually, much to our surprise, wanted to speak with us. How long have you been driving trucks? On and off 20 years. For the first hour, hour and a half of the interview, he never once asked us what crime we were investigating. And my impression of that is he didn't need to ask because he knew why we were there. He knew it and we knew it. They, they took movies that I had in the trip and made it seem like I was the worst mass murderer you ever seen in your life. Just because I, have, I like horror movies. We did not have the benefit of the forensic results. So this whole interview w was done um, basically with my partner and I just feeling out Adam Lane as we went. Did you go anywhere else? No. Did you leave? We told him, we're not here because we think you did something in New Jersey. We told him we're here because we know you did something in New Jersey. And you could see Adam Lane's demeanor start to change. My impression of it was he was starting to come to the realization that he was caught. And after several seconds, he said the words, I'm done. I packed up our stuff. We turned off the tape recorder. Uh, my partner and I got up to leave. We walked out of that room. And after several minutes, Adam Lane uh, made a motion through the window of the door made a nod for us to come back in. And at that point, we knew exactly where we were. We knew that Adam Lane wanted to confess. This is gonna kill my family. That he wanted to uh, tell us what happened that night. She sit straight up and got out of bed when she seen me and started screaming. And I tried to get her to be quiet all over. He described how he stabbed Monica. I had the knife, it was on the bed. It's about that long, and she rolled against it and cut right here, best I could tell. And I'm no medic, cut this jugular vein right here. 
How far across? Okay. Out here. He described where he stabbed her. Between the legs, on the stomach. Did you have any sexual attraction during any of this? No. Did you? Uh, Look, I love my wife. You? I love my wife very much. I ain't out for sexual choice. What happened next then? She pled to death. I couldn't finish the fight. It didn't take very long. About how long? Less than 60 seconds. Adam Lane, no doubt about it, is perhaps the most dangerous man um, that I've seen personally. And the reason is because you know, there's no explanation. There is no why with Adam Lane. And he killed Monica Massaro just, in my opinion, for the sport of it. I received a phone call on my cell phone from the chief of police. They told us that Adam Leroy Lane had murdered a woman the night before he came to our house. When we heard that, we, we, were, we were just floored. We knew at that moment that we came seconds, milliseconds, from losing our daughter in the most horrific way possible. Why do you think Adam Lane suddenly confessed to murder? Chat now on Facebook and Twitter. My biggest fear after I lost my mom was that I was going to lose my dad. I didn't want him to end up in prison for something that he didn't do. Emotionally, I couldn't bear to lose another parent. I had been subpoenaed to appear in front of a grand jury the early part of September of 2007. And as it too close, the more worried I was getting. Several weeks after we submitted Adam Lane's knives to our laboratory for analysis, we received word of what the results were. The results showed that not only was Monica Massero's DNA uh, on his knives, but also Darlene Ewalt's from Pennsylvania. Her DNA was also on Adam Lane's knives. I found out that my mom's DNA was on a knife from the newspaper. I think I called my dad. I'm like, so you're clear? And then it just kind of becomes a blur after that, just knowing that finally that they have the evidence to clear my father. After we discovered that Darlene's blood was on the knife taken from Adam Lane, I did meet with Todd Ewalt. I explained to him uh, that we had found the perpetrator and apologized that he had been a suspect treated as he believed somewhat unfairly during the investigative process uh, and wanted him to know uh, that we would do whatever we could to bring Adam Lane to justice. I can't even begin to think of how bad it would have been if Lane was never caught. I think I would have been on trial for the murder of my wife. The DNA match of Darlene Ewald's blood on Adam Leroy Lane's knife uh, was a complete game changer. We knew that he was incarcerated, that he faced charges in Massachusetts, and he faced charges in New Jersey. Since he was locked up and we knew he wasn't going anywhere, we decided we would defer to Massachusetts and New Jersey uh, before commencing our prosecution here in Pennsylvania. Even though he terrified me, 
I wanted to face this guy down. I I'm sorry, but you don't come into my house and attack my family. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna watch you every step of the way. We knew pretty much from the outset that this case was not going to go to trial. There was really no defense that he had to offer. He was caught red-handed in the McDonough's house by the Chelmsford police. So at some level, we knew it was going to be a plea. And what it came down to was how long of a sentence were we going to get on this guy? The one sticking point for Adam Lane seems to be the sexual assault charge. He was adamant that he wasn't going to sexually assault Shay McDonough. This wasn't about sex. So I went to the McDonough's and we discussed it. If that was the one sticking point, did they feel comfortable with dismissing that charge if it meant that the plea would go forward on all the other counts and he would receive 25 to 30 years in state prison? That meant that Shay would not have to get up on the witness stand and recount everything that she went through that night and just traumatize her all over again. We said, okay, let's just accept the plea bargain and go forward with it. I would have liked to see a longer sentence, and that's what we were advocating for. But we also knew that Adam was going to face murder charges in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So at the end of the day, we knew he was never going to get out. I felt compelled that, okay, even though the legal battles for us were over, I was going to see this thing through, and I was going to make sure that I was at every hearing that he was at, that I was with the families of the other victims. We went down to the sentencing for Monica Massaro. This defendant showed absolutely no mercy toward Monica Massaro. We don't know why a person who is a husband and a father suddenly uh, commits these kind of acts. I just was heartbroken for Faye and Frank Massaro. Monica was their only child and only daughter, and their whole lives revolved around her. I remember giving Monica's mom a hug and just saying how sorry I was, and just really feeling her pain, and it, it was hard. It was really hard. As we were walking into the courtroom, we noticed this gentleman sitting against a railing outside of the courthouse, and he just looked lost. We learned that it was Todd Ewald, the husband of Darlene Ewald. I gave him a big hug, and I just felt like awful. Why am I here and his wife isn't here? I was just really thankful to meet him the first time, to be able to shake their hand and tell them thank you. For them to finally have their daughter's killer face the consequences for what he had done, I was relieved that they were able to be there and see him sentenced. More sentenced to serve 50 years in the New Jersey State Prison. I wanted to know why Lane would go off and start killing people. I started digging, looking for answers. It just snowballed, and it ended up turning into a book. It seemed like he had a normal childhood, and as far as we could see, that there was no criminal background. The police told me that it was very difficult on his family. We'll never probably ever know why he did what he did. There was more to write about because Lane still had to face the charges against Darlene Ewald. And I was determined that I was gonna be in that courtroom when he was sentenced. I could be there as a reminder to him that you know what, you killed those other women, but I'm still here and I'm gonna make sure you get what you deserve. How can you get 48 hours anytime, any place? Want a clue? Your iPad. Reality drama. Exclusive extras. To miss it would be a crime.
June 28, 2010, was the day that Lane was sentenced for the murder of my mother. The McDonough's were there, and the Massaro's were there. It showed a lot of solidarity between the families, the connection that we all feel as a result of being tormented by this guy. There was some tension in the courtroom, but there was also a lot of tears and pain. And then there was just nothing from Lane. He was a blank slate. It's like he didn't even care. We initially sought the death penalty against Mr. Lane. As we continued to talk uh, with the Ewald family, they were becoming uh, concerned about an actual trial, uh, you know, going through the emotional aspects of hearing about Darlene's death uh, in a trial, uh, the fact that a defense tactic might be to try and blame Todd uh, as, as the killer. A serial killer who police say went after random women along his truck route will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Lane pleaded guilty as part of a plea deal. Some of Ewald's family were in the courtroom today and they supported the agreement. It was not hard to accept a plea deal for life in prison with, for Adam Lane because whether he's on death row or not, it's not going to change my circumstances at all because nothing can make up for all of the pain that he's caused. There's just no way. I feel like if there's anything I can do for Nicole to make the road ahead easier for her, I owe it to her. I can call Jeannie anytime. She's programmed in my speed dial. And usually, at the end of every phone call, it ends with, I love you. It's great because it's almost like a second mother. The McDonough's are sort of like heroes in my book. They stopped an innocent man from going to jail. They put a guilty man away. And they saved countless women. It's hard looking at the other families and seeing that the hard times that they've been through and how traumatizing everything has been for them. And I do feel guilty that I'm still here and that others aren't, because it sucks. <laughs> she just was traumatized. She didn't want to get up out of bed. She didn't want to leave her room. When she was in the basement, she was terrified of people looking in. She had gone off to school. Um, and she had some anxiety. She thought she was ready to go on to college, and she, she had to come home. She, she, she couldn't be away from us initially. Therapy made a huge difference. I was able to just get a lot of emotions and feelings out that I didn't even know I, I had built up. And it was just a great feeling because now I feel like I'm able to let go and able to move on without holding a grudge and being angry. <laughs> every time I leave the house or every time I go anywhere, it's we never forget to say I love you because you never know what can happen. Somewhere good. And I know when I go to bed at night and I look at my husband, I think, you know, you are just my hero, really. I mean, he saved my daughter's life, he saved my life, he saved his own. We're here because of him, so he really is the hero. He's a hero. <laughs> I think about Monica and her family and the Ewalds and their loved ones that they've lost, and I say to myself, you know, why were we so lucky? But um, I feel that he was sent there to be stopped to our house. I feel there was a reason or a greater power that enabled us to stop on that night, and I, I feel he was sent there to be stopped.
Jeffrey was a great student, a valedictorian. And that's Ruth. The family was not the family that they appeared to be. Jeff told me that his mother was storing knives in her headboard. And then one day, something went horribly wrong. Nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. Next. On television, online, on the go, and now on iPad, CBS News.